Is it is it just React or is it anything else? It's Colby? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I grew up in LA. I was like, what did he do? Yeah, that, that totally brings me down, I gotta admit. So I know a lot of people, especially from Utah, are like historically uh, Lakers haters, but yeah, I grew up in Los Angeles, so it makes me feel sad. So. Anything you wanna, is, is, do you have any business related to this class that you wanna talk about? Yes. So, I'm trying to remember, because I've had a lot of different things. Do you want us to be skimming the chapters that we're reading in the class, or like actually reading them? Like, because I remember someone said once, like, oh, skim this, but I don't remember what the class was. Okay, Bonnie's asking, do I, do I want you to read or skim? I, I'm trying to be explicit in the reading instructions. Uh, if it says skim, skim. If it doesn't say skim, then uh, you should prob you're gonna need to know it sooner or later. Uh, and it's gonna be in your, uh, you know, material from there is gonna be in the quiz anyway. Um, so, does that answer? Yeah. <clears throat> yes, sir. Are the uh, quizzes fairly representative of the example exam questions, or <laughs> Yeah, I might the entire book. I believe I, I think about you guys in your situation constantly, like night and day. Like, what do I tell you about what you're supposed to know? And the answer is everything. It's, 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 it's like. Well, watching a bunch of Star Wars movies or something like what am I supposed to know like all of it do I have to know about Leia and Luke yeah everything uh, but well, what I do try <laughs> I know uh, there's just a <laughs> yeah yeah please don't please at the both now and in the future like please don't take the material as a reflection on me like it just is what it is and I try to make it as fun as I can today I have nice pictures and videos but it is what it is, and you know, 20, day, 20 years from now, you look back and you're like, oh yeah, networking stuff, I remember that. It, it is what it is, it's, it's not quite as fun as uh, Star Wars, but I, I, try to, I try my best to help. Um, <laughs> boy, I, I, miss, I miss the comment. <laughs> oh, should we should have done accounting? Um, I'll teach anything they ask me to teach, and they just say, hey, take this course. I'm like, it's all good. No, it's, it's actually fun, but it's just, it's a little hard to go through the first time. Um, and I, I honestly cannot think of an easier way to get through this. I know that as I compare to other classes like programming or analytics, it's like, in those classes we can sit, you know, I can just sit at the uh, keyboard and we can do stuff together. You do this, you do that. And this is a lot of concepts. And I obsess over, how do I make this not a bunch of concepts? And I don't really have an answer. I have activities that we do from time to time, but at the end of the day, it's a bunch of concepts you have to know for your career, and, 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 and the, one of the best ways to get that is reading. If I just give you a lecture format reading, like that's really painful. In any given chapter, there could be like 50 keywords you're supposed to memorize, and it's just, it just is what it is. Um, so I just feel like I just brought down my own. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> I, I, when I look over, okay, so when I look over a chapter, here's what happens with me as the reader in a chapter. I look over a chapter and I think, okay, here's some parts of it that are less important. Here's some parts that are more important. In class, I'm going to go over stuff that seems pretty high level and fluffy, but to me, it's like the most important things from that chapter. If I don't go over it, uh, like for example, for today's material, you have the uh, the CRC, the error checking, like. You don't need to know the math for that. But ahead of time, you don't know that that's in my head. Like, you're not going to need to know that for your career. It's nice to know that there's a way of error detecting, uh, you know, the, the bits that are coming across. But you don't actually need to know the math for that. So I try to give you some hints in the reading, say, okay, skim this. Uh, but the other stuff you're going to read, and then I'm going to hit at a high level what I think you actually have to know. 
So I will dial it in by what we do in class. Like you're not gonna know what was, what was I supposed to know when I read it, but I'm gonna dial that in in class and say this is what you're supposed to know. Yeah? Will, will there be some sort of like study guide in preparation for the exam? <laughs> like just that list you have on, on yeah. exams? Yeah. That's so, just pretty high. So are the qu so was the earlier question, are the quiz questions representative of uh, what will be on the exam? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so you should expect it to be something like, uh, yeah, with, without it being open note, you need to know it at that level. It's, and hopefully it's easier after we've had a discussion in class. Um, and then on top of that, I want a bunch of applied questions, uh, solve a problem, and essay questions, like describe how this works. So. It's, uh, <laughs> it's tough stuff. I, I re like I said uh, previously, I recommend you guys get together in groups, go over those, uh, those study areas, uh, the exam study areas, and, and have conversations about it, because that's what will get you through. Yes. Okay, so uh, last time we went through hardware, operating system sitting on there, how we're virtualizing and using Docker containers containerization to leverage our hardware these days. We talked a little bit more about our Raspberry Pis. I saw some diodes sitting out there in lab, so you guys have been playing with that. Um, I talked about the Thani IDE, and it struck me afterwards, why didn't I just open it up really quick? Because that only takes about 30 seconds. So, uh, as it relates to that, and you can even do this right now if you want. And if you want to be distracted the rest of class, you can play with Python in, this, uh, in your virtual window. So if you remote in to your uh, Pi device, from the, the equivalent of the start menu, you can go programming, go down there to Thani Pi IDE. And uh, you can see I was playing around earlier. So down in the lower window, I can do some, I can just type in uh, Python commands like print. Um, Hello world three. And if I hit return, this is like interactive mode. I could set variables and do all that stuff, and it'll work there. Or I could go up top, and I could actually create uh, files. So again, just uh, just print statements. Hello world four. And then in order to run it, I have to save it. So I'll say hello three dot pi. You can call it whatever you want. Just hello dot pi. Once it's been saved, uh, then you can just hit the run button and run it. Uh, so it tells you what you ran and it comes out there. So as you work with your electronics and your sensors, uh, you can just print uh, the feedback that you're getting back out to the screen. So anyway, I probably should have mentioned that previously. So it's just more fun if you guys get to play. We talked about some Linux stuff. We talked about Richard Stallman doing a whole bunch, putting together a bunch of great software for us and Linus getting all the credit. Uh, we talked about uh, CIOs, and in addition to software development, they need to understand the IT side of the house. We finally started getting into networking in here, the seven layer OSI bean dip model. Uh, some, of the, some of the things you want to remember about this are, are particularly the first four layers. Physical layers uh, is about the ones in the zero data layer, that's about your local networks. Network layer, that's primarily about IP addressing on the internet. Transport layer, that's about uh, assuring that your packets get reassembled appropriately because they're, they're numbered. Uh, again, you know, we talked about how this came later, this reference model came later. This came first when we went from DARPA, DARPANET, and ARPANET to actual TCP IP. So it looks pretty similar, but the categories of what they do map pretty well. Uh, this helps us understand the basket of technologies that we're going to play with over the course of this semester and throughout the rest of your life. We can reference them with respect to the layer that they sit in. Okay, so um, as we embark on talking about the physical layer today, I wanted, I, I, put the, I posted this question in Slack and this relates to a book that I was reading about how to be a member missionary by Clay Christensen, who sadly enough, when I Googled him this morning, he passed away like three days ago, it says. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, I was feeling super bummed. <laughs> so anyway, uh, in this book by Clay Christensen about how to be a member missionary, he was talking with some, 
some people in his home. Uh, and, and it struck him, and he was teaching us as readers, about how oftentimes we, we don't tell you know, new members of the church some of the critical things that they need to know. And especially investigators, maybe they aren't sure, how is it that we come to understand that God has given us an answer? So, so, so there's two questions for you then. And he, he has an answer, and I wish I hadn't left the, the book in the car, because his direct quote's way better than mine, my paraphrasing. Uh, but I'll ask this question to two sides of it. One, how do uh, you typically speak to God? If, if especially if we just kind of base it in our content, our topic for today, which is like the physical layer. Are you talking about prayer? Yeah. Physical. Are you talking about the details? There, yeah, yeah. I, I, more the mechanics. How do you talk to him? Okay, you said prayer. Okay. How how do you communicate with God via prayer, in terms of like physics? As far as physics goes. Yeah. I don't know if the physics of the matter, but um, like the way that I don't know. To me, it's kind of a just a joining of not only words but intent, like that kind of deep thorough aspect of the heart putting towards, like okay. aiming towards God, for lack of a better word, thinking of it, not just the words, but what you actually declaring how I feel and how I, what exactly my worries are, my concerns, what my desires are, like that. Okay, we're going deep. And, and I, I actually wanted to focus on kind of the, the physical aspect. And so we use words. <laughs> yes. Uh, we, we use words? <laughs> <laughs> Got it. I did uh, 404 when I wanted a 101. Okay. <laughs> uh, we use words, but how do we communicate those words? In English or your chosen language. Okay. H how do we communicate our words to him? Pardon? Oh, a two. Like, dear Heavenly Father, addressing. Okay, vocal cords. Okay, vocal cords. Okay. I know, it's a chance. You're like, where's this guy going? Okay. Okay, vocal cords. So sometimes we use vocal cords. Do we ever not use vocal cords in our prayers? Yeah. So sometimes we think and sometimes we use vocal cords. And I thought the more interesting part of this conversation he was having with an investigator was, how does God communicate to us? But that is a starting point. We know how maybe we communicate to him. How, how does he communicate to us? Thoughts, hearts, actions of others. Okay, and again, let's base it in physics. Oh, okay. Then let someone else do that. I'm not an expert on this. I just thought it was an interesting conversation that he put out there. Desmond? Okay, scriptures. So visually, you know, some photons of light are bouncing off a page and hitting our eyes. So, so visually, God communicates with us, and then it turns into electrical impulses and then communicates with our, our spirit. Okay? Visually, how else does God speak with us, Lindsay? So yes, we do have our general ways of being communicated to, and then there's individual ways. Um, and you know, did anything happen to Joseph Smith that's different than happened to you? So, perhaps. Uh, so, so what are some of the individual ways that God might communicate to us? Yeah. Uh, just gonna say audibly. I mean, like audibly. Okay. Sit and watch the conference or go to church. So, so God can vibe. Uh, so, as part of you receiving that, you might, uh, as you hear things, there are vibrating molecules in the air that vibrate your eardrum, and then it, you know, stimulates electrical impulses, and then now it's communicated to your soul. Okay. And, and that, I perhaps almost want to stop there, McKay. Uh, what else? But, but I'll ask again, again, is there any other ways you can think that God communicates with us? Yeah. Spirit, okay. And how did... All right, and then Levi again. Yeah. Warm, okay. Graham, Graham. So, so you're posting marriage photos. Like, so how long would you get married? Wait, I don't want to get a question to you. That was <laughs> <laughs> I was married uh, like a week ago. Uh, we, okay. Wait, okay. what? <laughs> Also, I was going to say that I think it's 
sometimes I think through a problem. Uh -huh. I, you know, after I pray, I'll think it, ponder over a bunch of different things, and if if I think on something that's right, I well, somehow that's going to make it easier. The rest ponder of over. Okay. Yeah. So maybe one of the mediums is my own thoughts. Okay. So so I don't have like all the answers to this. I just think it's a fun conversation because I. It's just not something I've thought about too deeply before I was reading it, as he was trying to help um, somebody get an answer to their prayer, this confirmation you know, that God lives and this, that this church is true. And, uh, and as part of this, he was, and, and he, he was working at Harvard, so everybody's like super intellectual, and that's probably that's how they process all the information in this world. And so he was telling this story, and I wish I had the direct quote with me, but um, it said that, you know, hey, if we're, if we're talking in the real world, if we're talking face-to-face -face in the same room, I have some thoughts, I vibrate my vocal cords, the air molecules get vibrated, it goes over and it vibrates your, um, your eardrums, it gets turned into electrical impulses and then you hear, but, or, and then you understand. But he says that doesn't work on the moon because there's not air to carry the vibrations from person to person and so we'll use something electronic to communicate from place to place. And so he was kind of asking the person, so why is it that you expect that God is gonna communicate only verbally to you through a voice, like why, why would he go through the hassle of, of um, you know, doing this expected way of doing things when there's when he could do things more directly? And so his his kind of proposition in here was that kind of like just with the walkie-talkies and stuff like that, uh, like on the moon, like he can communicate directly to us, and we don't have to go through the intermediaries of vibrating um, vibrating air molecules. And so in some cases that would be true. There, there's a lot based on what you said. There's different things that he could do. But uh, I just thought that was an interesting way of looking at it. I hadn't thought about it that way. Anyway. Okay. Um, so, we're going to talk about ways that commu uh, computers communicate uh, through physics, through electrons primarily, uh, today. Uh, I don't really love this particular diagram, but uh, just kind of as a, a framing piece, we can think about us as having local area networks, like this, for example, represents a house, and this over here represents maybe some office space somewhere. And as we go from place to place across the internet, the little symbols there with the red arrows, those are routers. Uh, so in that vein, in that space, we communicate using IP addresses. And down here, we communicate using ethernet technologies and using something called MAC addresses. So the way that networks work is different depending on whether we're talking about the highway versus the off-ramp. That was another analogy I've heard. Uh, this is kind of like getting off the freeway and we have a different way of communicating in these areas. But just at a high level, keep that in mind. Okay, talking about the physical layer. We're aware that a lot of the letters that we use in English communication get in, that can get uh, translated into binary. So if we're talking about just the English language, we can use ASCII, uh, 256, uh, you know, between zero and 256 as a number can represent lowercase a through z and uppercase a through z as well as some punctuation. Uh, so we just need to have a way then to communicate, particularly as, as it relates to today on our local area networks, we need a way to convey all our ones and zeros across a wire. Uh, one of the ways that we communicate is a wire, although we can also use waves, light waves, radio waves, etc. Copper's a good way of, uh, it's a good medium for communication because it's cheap and it's easy to push electrons from, from one atom to another. Uh, there are different categories of ethernet cables like you've seen. Um, and we, we refer to them as like, you know, cat three, four, five, six, seven. And that just refers to how fast we can push uh, data through it in terms of ones and zeros, what it's rated for. Uh, through most of my life, we've talked about like cat five and 100 base T, uh, or 100, uh, be able to send 100 megabits per second across the wire. Uh, these days, I think we, for, for one of these ethernet cables, we prefer to at least have one gigabit per second. Uh, does anybody know, this, this is what you guys built. Does anybody know what this is with the tin foil on it? Conspiracy theory. What? It's like, sorry, tin foil hats. <laughs> tin foil hats. <laughs> so this is called unshielded twisted pair. This is called shielded twisted pair. So UTP, STP, 
We don't see this a lot, but as we try to get more speed out of a particular wire, one of the things that holds us back is noise. And one of the things that causes noise is, well, everything in the environment that could impact those wires. So sometimes just running it through a ceiling, whether uh, industrial equipment, a any machine can, uh, the, the waves, yeah. So like, a good example of that is like, it's really bad practice to like ever have Ethernet cords go over floor and lights because they produce like a wave that distorts like the traffic. Because it's like the same frequency as internet data, but like just destroys any data flow you have. So if your like cord ever goes over fluorescent lights, you get like 50% packet loss. Like, you can use shielding. So, like, it, it, I hadn't actually heard that before. Another thing I've, I've, I've heard of though is microwaves. That microwaves are supposed to be horrific. So don't run your ethernet cables right by your microwave oven. Uh, from time to time, that's gonna cause a lot of interference as you go along. Um, so here's an example of CAT3. Other than this picture, I've actually never seen CAT3. Um, there's your CAT5 cable. Last time we made cables, I uh, actually intended, yeah, Nathan. So how did they get the, like the 40 gigabits a second? Do they use just the same eight wires or do they have a different cable that travels all the wires? I'll, I'll try to talk about that in just a second. So, well actually, this is, this is the prime time to talk about it. Uh, <laughs> so you, your request is granted. <laughs> so, so I had intended to kind of go over this, this one and this one before we actually made our cables, but got a little behind last time. So in, in typical uh, ethernet cabling, there are four pairs of twisted wires. The, the twisting is actually what limits the noise from happening, the electrons from jumping onto wires that aren't supposed to be there or jumping off. And uh, historically, as we're looking at like 100, like 100 megabit per second ethernet, we only used half of the pairs of wires in there, so half of them were dead. So we, we potentially weren't even using um, four wires out of eight. But as we've gotten to eight uh, gigabit per second ethernet, we have to use all wires. One of the tricks with these is that the wires aren't bi-directional, so you're, you're typically sending one signal one direction and one signal another direction on another wire. Um, so before, for 100 megabits per second and 10 megabits per second, it was sufficient to just use a couple of the wires, but as we get into higher speeds, they have to use all of the wires. They just haven't figured out how to do it on fewer wires. Um, there is an, okay, so there's an ordering that goes with this, as you learned last time. There's a couple standards. Um, T568B is for this order. Now, in the real world, as long as it matches up on both sides, it's just a copper wire, it doesn't matter. But in terms of maintenance, it's kind of nice if you have a common order going there. So white, orange, orange, white, green, blue, et cetera, in that pattern. So I, I intended to show you that before we started on stuff, but didn't get that far. Uh, historically, it used to be a big issue as we connect uh, um, equipment using one of these wires, what order the, the wires were in, because sometimes you would have to flip it uh, if you're going between one piece of equipment and another, but in the modern era, it's become less important for that to happen. So as we go, for example, between a router and a switch and some other devices that I have there, sometimes uh, we would have to flip the cables. Or if we go directly from one computer to another, you could connect them to play video games. That was a big thing when I was in yeah. dorm rooms and stuff. Uh, we used to have crossover cables. We used to have, if we went directly between two computers, we'd have to flip them. Now our, our network cards are smarter, and so it's not as, as big of a deal as it used to be. But if you do any certification in this area, they're still going to abuse you in terms of that knowledge. Okay, so now that you know all about the uh, colors in a wire, do you want to go out something that's going to, anyway. <laughs> Ladies, you can, you can buy this, buy this shirt, and only some people are going to know what it is. <laughs> it made me smile. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, I suppose there could have been a guy version. That's just what came up. <laughs> All right. So in addition to copper cables, we also send our, our ones and zeros uh, using fiber optic cables. Uh, so fiber optic cables are just either plastic or glass that are contained in some type of cladding, and we just balance light uh, along the pathway, and it just bounces through the inside of the casing. This one actually is a, a, a special kind. Uh, when, you have high, when you have storage and high-speed storage that all of your servers are accessing, 
we use these kind of cables to plug things together. So we have a server closet uh, in the lab room area, and um, so we use those type of cables. Those are fiber optic cables, but those are just really short. They're meant to connect our, our servers, our web servers, to our data storage arrays. So we oftentimes consider that, oh, copper's not fast enough. We want to be even faster with our fiber optic. As it relates to fiber optic and what's important or not important, it's good, you know, we don't have to know too, too much. Uh, yeah, there's a core that the light bounces around in, uh, and it's glass or it's plastic. But the other thing I want you to know is two types of glass fiber, of, of fiber optic cables. One of them is single mode and the other one's multi-mode. Does anyone know when you use single mode versus multi-mode? Just in case you have any jobs that are in this space. Probably not something that keeps you awake at night, at least at this point. Uh, so if we were to go around on campus here, as we go in between buildings, there will be just big old bundles of fiber running between all the buildings, and uh, it will have both single mode and multi-mode fiber. The, the trick with uh, multi-mode or single mode, single mode is good for really high speed over long distances. So if we're gonna go between here and Salt Lake, uh, then we're gonna, we wanna run a single mode fiber. It's gonna have less degradation of the signal over a long distance. Uh, Multi-mode fiber is about carrying lots of channels of information. So rather than just one signal going through it, you can have tons of signals going through it simultaneously. So you're, so you're multiplying the amount of data that you're sending through the, the, the glass by just bouncing the light at different angles. I don't know physically why they don't do that over long distances, but I could, you know, I could guess. Yeah? Oh, goodness, sorry. <clears throat> um, so the multi-mode does not do well for does well for like lots of signals, but it's typically not used yeah, for Yeah, yeah. Okay. Other stuff. Let us. All right. Look, here's here's a map that shows where fiber optic cables are laid throughout the ocean. Uh, you may have heard in the past sometimes we can cut off an entire nation's internet access by just clipping that uh, cable sitting under the sea. Uh, and just kind of for giggles, let's uh, watch a, a video about how they actually... Oh, hold on. Where did it go? All right, hold on a second. This would work better on a, uh, on a PC because I can embed the videos, but uh, not so much on this Mac. Okay. No, it's just in this application. <laughs> it's just in this application. Top hundred sports movers. So how do they lay these cables?
that Donald Trump was just impeached. <laughs> Last night, Donald Trump became the third. Yeah, the fact, other than it's deep, I don't, it's not, I don't think there's any police there, you know, police, sharks, or, well, yeah, I, I mean, as you get to shore, so, quite my line of business, but I'm, there's going to be an answer out there. I don't know. It, it is a good question. How often have you thought about how like, your internet gets to England? Like, I didn't really think that much about that on that. And I was like, okay. So I thought like most people are just like, internet's magical. I have physical cloud. <laughs> yeah, ignorance is probably bliss. And, and there's a certain amount of security that comes from having nobody know. Um, but if you did know, and you could just, you know, get a diver down there and so like, if we were in like some war or something, would that theoretically work? We'd be like, oh, psych, you don't get internet. Like, could we do that? All right, so back to war and nuclear missiles again. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, yeah, communications are a huge deal in, as it relates to warfare. And, uh, uh, and that's the whole reason why the internet, ironically, that's the whole reason why the internet was created to begin with, was to have redundant pathways to get information from one place you know, among American forces to another place among American forces, even if you cut one of the channels. So I'm sure that all the, the warfaring countries out there as they're thinking about their strategies, I'm, I'm sure they've got, you know, their eyes on all the satellites, all the cables they'll clip and everything else to try to cripple communications in and, and the case of something bad happening. Yeah? Uh, I was just reading about, um, there was a story about the U.S. government actually like, tapped into one of these, like Russia had some cable that they had that was like, Sounds like something the military would do. But I'm sure we could do something like that. Yeah, yeah, sure that could be done as well. So that probably brings you back over to Wells class. Make sure you encrypt your traffic, right? Um, all right, uh, I want to show off some devices here. So you have seen, of course, well, this is a, a network card, the kind that we used to physically put in PCs. And before the wireless days, we would just run something like this directly over to our home. We just run it over to our home router. Uh, eventually our home router's got these little wireless things. Um, but it's the same principle, whether it's wired or not wired. Um, from here, well, if we're, if we're in an enterprise environment, well, okay. So I've got some consumer equipment and some more enterprise type equipment here. Um, if I were to go from here out to the internet, historically, we, we have a connection that goes from here to, to this thing. This is a router. So typically, and there's not a lot of ports on this router. Uh, typically one of the, th this allows us to bridge networks. So this is that symbol with multiple arrows going across it uh, in one of the previous diagrams we saw. So this is something that would directly connect, up, connect us to the internet through one port, and then through another port, it would connect to our building and our organization to give internet access to that whole building. Uh, in terms of physically connecting then lots of different computers that are in a building, this is a switch. So in maybe in the older days, what we could do is we could physically connect a whole bunch of PCs to this, and then one of these ports would then go to the router, and then that router goes out to the internet. Um, additional pieces of cabling here. This is a patch panel. So if I, so this computer right here, 
is going to have an Ethernet connect uh, jack somewhere in there. That Ethernet jack is going to run through the ceiling somewhere and then drop down. In, there's, there'll be a cable that will drop down into a closet. And as it drops down into that closet, it will look like this as it comes through. And we will plug it into a patch panel like this. And then to create, a, then the next step is we're going to go from, from um, this particular port over, now we want to get internet access to this computer. So we'll go from this port then, which is now connected to this. Um, we're going to go from this port into a switch. So we'll go from here, yeah, we'll go from here to here. So now there's a direct line from this computer through the wall all the way into this switch. And then from this switch, I'll run another cable over to the router. The router will then be connected to the internet. So these are just some of the devices that run behind the scenes. And uh, some of this I'm gonna have you price out in a, in a future homework assignment. Oh, other fun stuff here. Um, all right, hopefully this isn't too heavy to pass around, William. So this would just be an example of your telecommunications <laughs> providers and the, <laughs> the kind of wiring that they send throughout the neighborhoods. Um, this one, I believe, is fiber optic cabling. It's a lot lighter. This one has just this one has just one piece of wire going through it, and I'm going to talk about this one in just a second. Yes, Peter. If I remember right, what is on the last is talked about like the learning outcome being knowing the difference between a router and a switch. I uh -huh. say an exam. Are we going to need to know just the high level difference of the router is the one that connecting us to more to the internet yes, definitely. and the switch is dispersing it, or are we going to need to know like actually what a switch is doing? Definitely. Down as opposed to a router. Okay. The, the, the level of understanding you need to go to in this discipline um, and in this class is that a router definitionally bridges networks. It can bridge two different networks. So in this case, we've kind of got our, um, we've got our local area network maybe in the building, and then we have the broader internet. Yeah. So those are two completely different networks. It bridges two different networks. Uh, our switch is going to allow us to communicate among a bunch of devices within our local network. Yeah. And we're going to actually cover some more about that. That's the level of understanding that you need to have. Okay. Pretty Well, pretty much. <laughs> there's there's going to be some, some uh, nuances that are going to come up right now. <laughs> All right. So here is a diagram of how these things might connect uh, together. Um, where should we start? Uh, let's start with all you know the physical equipment that we're used to having. So we have desktops, laptops, tablets, etc. And they might communicate wirelessly to a what we call a Wi-Fi router. Um, from that connection, we then go over to a hub. And then from a hub, we can connect to a router. The router bridges two networks, the internet network, and then the internal office network. Uh, this hub also attaches us to it looks like they're all wired, but conceptually they're trying to say with the with this wireless one, those are wireless connections. And then to the to the same network, we also through the hub here or the switch, we have uh, physical connections being made as well through cables. So that's how we structure uh, a typical office-based network at the easiest level. Eric? So then let me just make sure I understand this correctly. Yeah. All of the routers are connected to switches, and the switches communicate between the routers, and then the routers connect to two different... Wait, okay, so I caught you when you said that routers connect to the switches, yes. Okay. What was the next thing you were saying? Then, sorry, my mouth is a little numb. No, it's not you, it's me. Um, oh. <laughs> 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 well, I have broke a little bit there, but um, from, so the switch, Almost looks like it's another router in some in some way. Am I understanding that? The switch something? looks like a router. Yeah, in far in so far as that it's also connecting servers, printer, client, or is it just? Um, how do I put it? So, I, so that's the thing I don't understand. Is why is the client connected to the switch and not the router? Why is the client connected to the switch and so not the router? This client right here, bottom right. Like, oh, that one that says client. Yeah. Why is that? Okay. 
this is your, in terms of like a hub and spoke, your, your switch is your hub for all of your devices that are in the same network that want to talk to one another. Yep. Once they want to get out of that network, this is where they go. <laughs> they have one place to go. And we usually only put like one, a couple of ports on there. We don't, this one can have 24, 48, 24 to 48 ports on it mm -hmm. to connect to all the computers in a given office space. Mm -hmm. This one, as you see on the back, might only have two or four. Yeah. It's just a bridge two networks. Kaylin? <laughs> Um, I feel like the biggest difference is is the router like will assign IP addresses and the switch won't. Like for example, like if you connect to a router, then the router will like can give you an IP address. Or if you connect to a switch that gives you a connection, but you can't you don't have an IP address, so you can't reach it. Let's let's not run with that right now. So everybody ignore what he said. <laughs> we'll, we'll cover IP addressing. It's not you, it's him. <laughs> IP, there, IP addresses are involved, but I want to be careful about how I explain it. Um, yeah? So if you wanted to transfer your device, your data by one gigabyte to divide 100 megabytes, do you have to have that cable connecting everything, or just specifically to the router? Okay, so, so his question is, uh, how do we get fast communication among any of our links? And there's two parts to it. Um, one is, is, is the cable of a sufficient grade to carry that level of traffic? And two, is the networking component on each side sufficient to carry that? So for example, uh, this is an older one that only handles, this one handles 10 megabits per second and 100 megabits per second, but the ones we have in the closet are a gigabit per second. So because this one's a little older, I'm just using it as garbage. So, um, and, and same thing on the other side. If you, have, if you have a 100 megabit per second card rather than a gigabit per second card, your faster devices on the other end will just drop down to compensate for the fact that you have older equipment. Okay, Bonnie? Okay, you might have talked about this. Okay. I miss this. But, so I understand like how we're sending data through cables. Uh-huh. But I don't understand how data communicates from like a router to like a wireless laptop. How does how does the how does like internet connectivity yeah. make it from a router to a wireless laptop? Yeah. Um, that that is something I want you to know before this class is over. Okay. So I will give you a brief answer, mm -hmm. but you don't have to know it based on what I'm saying right in this moment. You know, the brief answer is there is a there's a there's a packet that comes in with a certain IP address on it, and then also something on there, uh, some additional port information. It shows up to the router. The router says, "Oh, I know where that goes." It hands it off to the switch. Um, the switch looks up, looks at the packet, and says, "Oh, I know where this is destined to, based on something called a MAC address." And then it says, and then it sends it. Oh, whether it well, it, pretend the Wi-Fi router doesn't exist for a second because it's it's really doing the same the exact same functionality as the switch. Okay. It just does it wirelessly. It's the exact same functionality. Both of those talk to these devices based on something called MAC addresses. So the, the information that comes in it makes it to the switch, and the switch says, oh, this is destined for a particular address, and it gives it to that particular device, the, a packet of information, a series of ones and zeros with the to from address on it. And the MAC address is part of the data link layer, right? Yes, that's correct. And we're going to cover that uh, as soon as humanly possible, either today or next time. Okay, Jocelyn first, and then Evan. Okay, so, okay, so here's something that gets a little bit confusing I think in the study of networking. This is called a Wi-Fi router and it has technically many devices built into it. So back in the old days we would, well, and still in enterprise functions, we'll just have one device that does one thing and it does it very well. Um, like an object in program. It does one thing. Um, like this is just a switch, this is just a router. This, this consumer grade device is a composite device. It has a switch in it. Switch means something very special to me, and hopefully to you in the near future. 
Um, it has this cable right here for the internet so that it's a router. It's actually gonna bridge, bridge two different networks, your home network and the internet service provider. It's got a firewall built into here. So that's a completely separate device which can limit the traffic that flows through it. So it's got at least three different devices built into it. But it's consumer grade so it's not like, it's not meant for you know, tens of thousands of people using it simultaneously. So, okay, other, uh, yeah. As far as I'm concerned for today, the, hub, the, the switch and the router could be combined into one device. They're functionally doing the same thing, just, yeah. Okay, um, more physical layer stuff, signaling. We need to be able to encode, to be able to take something from an application, um, the letter H in the word hello, and turn it into something that can be sent across one of these wires in ones and zeros. So we have different ways that we can do signaling. If we do digital signaling, we can do something like raise and lower voltage to, to represent a one or a zero. Or uh, because that's you know the original way of doing it, we've now advanced to we're like, okay, if we if we do some more discrete steps in between there, maybe we have a batch of ones and zeros so that we can get more communication going through. But we don't need to know it at that level. At the highest level, which is what we need for our discipline, it's just hey High voltage, uh, that could be a one. Low voltage could be a zero. And then we pick something in between and maybe make that be the signal you know, so that we know it's connected so we can turn on our little green light uh, on the back of our device so we know it's connected. Uh, similar, similarly, in, a, in addition to just straight voltage, uh, we also have um, another way of sending information is over waves, so like radio waves, sound waves. Um, that looks like this, so it's not discrete. But we can change the amp. One of the ways that we can send a signal over an, uh, over analog uh, is we can just change the amplitude. So maybe large could be one and small could be <coughs> zero. Uh, Carly? Yeah, I was just going to, this is kind of unrelated, so I don't know if I know the answer to this, but um, you're talking about how quantum computers have like the superposition of mm -hmm. zero. How does that work for translation? Sorry, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, only zero. Yeah, I'm, there, there are people, yeah, there's the whole engineering discipline that's consumed with how can we make these basic concepts work better. In, in some cases, what we do is we just uh, lever. Sometimes, sometimes there are there are shortcomings in the way we did things originally. Sometimes we kind of just band aid over it, and sometimes we create new things. And that's that's somebody else's discipline. So yes, people are working on that all the time. Um, okay. So just being aware that those are different ways that you could uh, send ones and zeros. Uh, if we have, I don't, I think we would have more fun today if I had to do some converting from binary, ASCII to binary and stuff, but I wanna get through a little bit more material today. Uh, at a high level, we just know people communicate, uh, you know, in words and computers have, computers have to change, you know, those words and those letters into ones and zeros. So, um, so for the next minute or two, I wanna talk about just numbering systems as it relates to computers. So have, have many of you noted that sometimes the, either the storage space or the transmission speeds are represented either with a, a lowercase b or an uppercase b? Uh, just, just for a second, maybe Google uh, your speed. Like so, so if you know uh, what your hard drive space is, see if it's at the large b or the little b. And if you have a certain data plan, for, for your home or for your particularly for your phone, could you look it up and see if it's a small b or a little b? So that's or a big b or a little b? You? Sorry, I guess the same thing. What? Yeah, at least for me personally, I've been tricked a lot. <laughs> I always thought it was one thing and it turned out to be another thing. They were only giving me an eighth the speed that I thought that I was getting. Oh, little b is this. Yeah, when they use a small b. Oh, I am. I am disappointed in Google Fiber now. Shoot. They used a little b. <laughs> Nothing. Google Fiber uses the little b, it looks like. 
how it self activated was. Yeah, so with hard drives, with hard drives, are we usually talking big B or little b? Big B, yeah. Big B, yeah. And, uh, and oftentimes in data communications, we find ourselves using little b. So, at least for me in the past, I've been a little bit suckered by this. I thought, oh yeah, this is, you know, if a video is one or two gigs in size, one or two gigabytes, and then my internet speed is like, you know, something gig, that gigabit per second, then I should get that in one second. No. Because uh, they use the small b. So, so they're really just talking about the bits. It would have to be eight times faster in order for me to actually get that in one second. Yeah. Does it exist in relationship between like megabits and megabytes, for example, is a one eight yeah. ratio? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so. So if you're getting gigabits versus gigabytes, you're only getting one eighth of what you think. So a gig, so one gigabyte connection is eight gigabits per second. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it would be, but when they typically don't represent it that way. Typically with storage, we talk in bytes, and typically in data communications, they're, they're showing things in bits, but I think much of the world ends up getting tripped up about that. We don't actually know what we're talking about. But now you will be smart consumers. Okay, so there's math related to that. We don't have to talk about it. Uh, so don't memorize. Yeah, so you know about the ASCII table and the extended ASCII table. So the nice thing is that within just a series of eight bits, we could we get something called a byte and we can represent uh, American symbols. Uh, another, another area where we use uh, a unique kind of numbering is we oftentimes in computers we'll see things represented in hexadecimal. Hexadecimal is just really zero through 15 as represented by zero through F. One example of, of a place that you see this all the time is if we look at our MAC address related to our networking cards. Um, it's displayed in a combination of letters and numbers. Uh, there's something special about hexadecimal and it's, it's that the numbers that are represented there are half of a byte. And half of a byte is called a? Nibble. It's a nibble. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you just made my day, man. <laughs> so, such a bad pun. <laughs> but it's true. So, so sometimes, sometimes in computer. So, so here's the high level idea. Here's the high level idea. As we're shooting a whole bunch of bits through this cable, uh, sometimes we don't need to send eight bits to communicate something. Sometimes we just need to send four. And if we send, if we're just sending four, we can re represent it as a nibble or hexadecimal. It's equivalent. So, stuff to know. We'll, we'll, do, we'll deal with this more in the future. Okay. Here's another, here's another uh, thing related to computer numbering. So this I would call character encoding. So we're familiar now with ASCII that with one single byte or eight bits, we can represent, um, and technically, well, I don't want to, okay, I'm not gonna go off on a tangent. Okay, <laughs> with ASCII, with one byte, we can, re we can represent the uh, alphabet in our language. Um, however, we know that there's other languages out there and other people who don't want to get left out, and so we need to represent international symbols and characters. And so with that, we have one, the way that we can represent their information is through Unicode. Unicode takes up more storage information. So you can see here some different uh, columns. So we have like, for example, UTF-8, UTF-16, UTF-32. So if you chose a different encoding as a programmer or somebody working as a database administrator, uh, what is the impact of choosing maybe one form of Unicode versus another? What is your impact? Peter? Yeah, yeah, so, so one thing is data communications. Maybe if I'm using UTF-32, now I have to send, you know, a lot more, I have to send a lot more bits through here to send the letter A versus if I was using just plain ASCII. So there's a performance implication there. Same thing with storage, basically, 
Storage, we might, we might end up taking up four times as much storage just to store the letter A. So rather than having one terabyte, we have four terabytes of storage just by changing the encoding. Um, fun little story, does anybody know uh, the motivational speaker, Tony Robbins, Anthony Robbins? Okay, so I actually did some work for his company at one time and we were sending information between two systems that he had and things were breaking. Some of the orders weren't going through as we were going from one system to another. And the re it took me like two days and probably at least, you know, well, it, I, the billing hours to him probably cost him about $700 for me to determine that the, a dash was the problem. Visually on the screen, uh, it was just a dash. But when I was doing all this like checking, eventually I eliminated all other possibilities and it was down to the dash. It turned out as it came out of one system, the dash was encoded in one format and another system was encoded at, coded in another format. It was only programmatically that I could actually determine that there was a difference in the dash. And anyway, so it took me like two days to figure that out and cost him a whole bunch of money. So as a programmer, there's implications to this stuff. Like who knew? Um, he was losing orders until then though. Okay. Um, at some point we do need to practice uh, decimal to binary stuff. Uh, particularly as it relates to IP addressing. Uh, as we look at IP addresses, any we usually have four four slots with an IP address, and they go for, those numbers can range anywhere from zero to two fifty six. So you need to be really good at working with bytes. You, you need to be able to go from um, bytes to whole numbers and back again. Uh, do you guys feel comfortable with doing this stuff yet? Uh, if not, then I will plan that as an activity for maybe like one or two days from now, say, but we have to do that. Uh, but I'll tell but just as a, at a high level, there's, there's, kind of, there's like three different ways to look at this. Do you want to just start with the simplest way first? Okay, I'm kind of a simpleton, I think. So when I, trans when I go back and forth from binary to whole numbers, uh, the way that I remember it is that there's eight slots. I start with one on the right, and then I just double it until I get to the other side. So one, two, three, four, five. So, um, so that's how I complete the table for when I'm going to go back and forth from a whole number um, to binary. And then once that table is put together, you, uh, it's, those are then kind of placeholders for composing some other number. So if you see binary, you say, oh, okay, I'm going to need 1, 1, 1, 16, 1, 32, and 1, 28. We add those all up. And now I have the number 177. So we need, as part of this class, to be able to go back and forth. Uh, we need to be able to go from just the binary, write out our little table, and say, oh, okay, this, this, this series of binary happens to represent uh, 177. We need to be able to go the other way as well, which is start off with the number 177 and turn it into that. Uh, again, you have to create your little table of information. Uh, the trick to reversing the process and going from a number to binary is you go from left to right. So you say, okay, out of 177, what's the highest number that I can take out of that? Oh, 128. Anyway, it, it's, it's easy math, I can show it later. I'll plan it for another day. Okay, last couple items. Uh, noise, as we've talked about before, noise is bad. Uh, electrons jump around easily and so what we intend to send looks like this what it gets received at actually looks like that but computers are smart and as long as it's not too bad they can deal with it um, another fun fact before we get on to Ethernet related stuff is Hertz yeah you want to hear about Hertz okay so you saw I I'm gonna come back to this another time but so remember with analog signals, it's that wave. Okay, so waves, they all happen to tra tra uh, travel pretty much the same speed. They all travel at nearly the speed of light. Uh, so whether it's, a, so some waves, you can, you can make them, some of them can be as long as, as you go from up to down and back up again, that's a cycle. Um, sometimes the distance of that cycle is an entire football field. On the other side of things, it can be, you know, almost atomic. Like they can get really small. So, the usage of waves to com to communicate is regulated in our country. Uh, so, on the big end of things, we that's oftentimes used for like AM radio. 
So that could maybe span a whole football field. On the small end of things, that could be used for um, looking at um, doing an x-ray on your body. Uh, and also on the small end of things, you have 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz. Those actually relate, relate to the wireless spectrums that we typically use for Wi-Fi. Um, and so the thing with hertz is because some are, they're all traveling at the same speed in, in terms of how fast that thing's going, but the distance is different. Because the distance is different, uh, a cycle is how fast it's hitting a fixed point as it passes it. So hertz is how many cycles are passing a fixed point at a given time. So amplitude mod modulation, AM radio, is going to be a lot slower in terms of that number, whereas Wi-Fi is actually pretty small, and so 2.4 and 5 gigahertz is like, that's really fast. That's, that's hitting this point, many, there are many, many waves per second are, are crossing that boundary. So I plan to talk more about Wi-Fi another day, but uh, just an intro. Okay. Sorry, it's a little bit like the Discovery Channel today. Here's the spotted frog. Here's the spotted frog being eaten by a bird. I know, it's not as fun as, as hands-on. Um, I just wanted to cover a little bit more information. I'll try to be nicer in the future. Okay. You ready for 10 minutes of Ethernet? Yeah. Get some reading on it. All right. We can do it. Okay. All right. Okay, so I talked about how we have different in Yeah. Harry! So we have our different we have our different networks. So moving up the OSI layers, moving so leaving the the physical layer, uh, just transmitting ones and zeros using electricity or other types of waves. Um, uh, we're now going to talk about how we communicate.